So now we're going to talk a little bit about security, which uh, similar to performance is very important for uh, GHS2 applications to keep in mind. Um, it's important for a number of reasons, but one of them, uh, I mean, obviously for, for its own sake, security is important, but it's also important for all the applications in DHS2 to, uh, to take security seriously, because if one application is uh, being used in a DHS2 instance and has a security vulnerability, it could compromise the entire system and all the other applications as well. So it's important to be a um, conscientious member of the DHS2 community by creating secure applications. Um, we're gonna talk about some specific uh, steps that you can take to secure um, certain parts of DHS2 apps. Um, this is not going to cover everything. There's a lot of um, additional details that we'll need to get into in the, in the future as well. So uh, for some best practices, we will be creating a dedicated security guide soon on the developer portal. But for now, there is a, uh, a good uh, kind of baseline guide available in the App Hub guidelines. Um, there's a security section in this, in this guide, um, which gives you a number of uh, concrete recommendations for um, to, to use in your applications. When um, specifically for, uh, the, these are things that we will look for when uh, reviewing uh, DHS2 apps that are submitted to the App Hub. Um, but if uh, they're, they're good guidelines to, um, to follow in any case. So let's start with data store security. Um, we talked about using the data store yesterday. We talked about the, uh, the app service data store. Uh, we used that in the, um, the example that I went over this morning. Um, but there are a few security considerations to keep in mind when you are using the data store to store information. Um, the first and most, most simple is uh, that you can reserve a namespace in the data store for your app, um, which prevents other applications from reserving that namespace. And it only it allows only users that have access to your application to see the reserved data store namespace. Um, and that applies to both the data store and the user data store. Um, if you are using a data store namespace, um, except for certain situations where you uh, expect to share that the information in that namespace with other applications or other users that don't have access to your app, um, you should always add a reserved namespace to your manifest file or your d2.config.js file, um, as we saw in the example earlier this morning. Um, you should also make sure that the namespace you choose is unique to only your application. Um, so you don't want to choose something that another application will developer will also choose and then you'll have conflicts so your one of your applications won't be able to be installed and the other one um, maybe if they are um, maybe one of them is not reserved then you'll have conflicts with um, the two apps trying to use the same data source Uh, this is how you reserve a namespace in DHS2 in a DHS2 application. In a platform app, you use d2.config.js and set the data store namespace key to the name of your that you want to reserve. And in manifest uh, web app for non-platform applications, it's in the activities DHS2 um, object space. Um, second, once you have reserved a namespace or if you're using a namespace that uh, you don't want to reserve because you want to give access to other users, um, you can set sharing permissions on the specific keys that you're using in the data store. Um, this is for the global data store rather than the user data store. Um, and basically, you can set sharing just like you can with any other metadata in DHS2, things like an indicator, a program, a visualization, a dashboard. All of those use the same sharing system under the hood. Um, by default, when you create a new key in the data store, it can be read and written by all DHS2 users. So if you're creating a new uh, data store key, use it carefully, um, and then you can use the sharing endpoint um, to set the sharing settings on DHS2, you can, or on the, on the data store key. Um, I didn't include a link here, but I'm going to add it. 
Um, the, you can find information about how to do this in the uh, developer documentation. This is the API docs um, where you can find everything that has to do with the, the DHS2 API. In the data store section, it will tell you how to get keys and namespaces from the data store, how to uh, create new values, how to update values, uh, how to delete values, and then also how to share data store keys. So this will allow you to set the sharing settings um, with a, an object like this for a particular key in the data store. I'm gonna go ahead and include that in this slide now as well. So when we share that, you will have access to it. There you are. Okay. Um, the, this is something that we will be adding to the app service data store in the near future, but it doesn't exist today. So if you want to use the global data store and you want to share your, um, your saved objects or your um, settings key with other users, um, you're going to have to use a manual uh, HTTP request or a, a data query in order to do that today. Um, but in the near future, we hope to add sharing to that um, library as well. Talking a little bit more generally about credentials, um, it's recommended never to store credentials in the data store. This means that um, if you're uh, allowing your user to, for instance, enter DHS2 credentials that then another user can use um, with basic authentication or something like that, um, that's not a good idea. Um, I would say that you should never store DHS2 credentials in the data store um, because then you're kind of defeating the purpose of the, the, um, the fact that those credentials exist um, because you're storing the, storing the credentials in the thing that you need credentials to access. Um, in some cases, it can make sense to save uh, credentials for external systems into the data store. Um, I'll get into a little bit more um, of some recommendations of uh, how to do this more securely, but in some cases that can make sense. Um, and in those cases, uh, you should always, uh, if possible, store those credentials in the user data store. So they're specific to a particular DHS2 user. And if you're using the global data store, you wanna make sure to set the sharing permissions uh, very narrowly. So you want to at least make it so that no one can, no one else can write those credentials without um, having certain privileges. Um, and probably in most cases, you want to also restrict who can read those credentials because they should be considered very sensitive. Um, and then the third uh, thing that you can do to help secure credentials when they're stored in the data store uh, is to set the encrypt equals true flag. Uh, um, this, it's again, I'm gonna go back to this documentation here. It talks about the encryption. Uh, you can pass encrypt equals true when um, uh, getting or setting a key in the data store. Um, and that will basically let you decrypt, encrypt and decrypt data at rest in the DHS2 database. And so if you're storing credentials, which again is not recommended generally, um, you should use this encrypt equals true flag. Um, there is a, a flag that was recently added to the data store provider for the app service data store to enable this encryption which you can use, but it is very, very nascent, very new. So make sure that you're um, uh, kind if, if there are issues um, and feel free to contribute back to that library as well. That's again, something along with sharing that we'll be pushing forward in that library as we move it into a more um, formally um, uh, supported library as part of the app runtime rather than as a separate um, proof of concept um, library. So that should be coming soon as well. Um, this is kind of goes without saying, uh, as we mentioned, but I've seen it in a few applications that tried to do this, but never, you should never have DHS2 credentials, um, used in the browser that are not the session cookie 
that the user already has. So in your application, the user that's logged in already has a session that's authenticated with cookies. Um, in some cases, uh, it might be tempting to say, like, save somebody else's credentials into the data store and then use those credentials from the browser with basic authentication to talk to DHS2. Um, but that is a, a pretty glaring security hole, and you should not do that. Um, there, uh, as far as I know, there aren't legitimate um, use cases to do that for the DHS2 server that you're talking to. Um, so be, be very careful if you're um, going down that path and think about it quite a lot. Um, that goes along with the user authentication model. So in, or authorization model. In DHS2, you have users, you have user roles, that are those users can be assigned to and you also have uh, authorities so an authority is assigned to a user and it gives the users with that role some uh, some permissions uh, that might be the ability to write uh, indi uh, a particular indicator to 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 update it it might be the ability to create new dashboards it might be the ability to um, view data at a certain um, at a certain level in the org unit hierarchy. Um, it's recommended or required that you sh your application should use that data model, use that authorization model and shouldn't allow users to kind of step outside of that and have more permissions than their, their user gives them, DHS2 gives them as a user. That's why you shouldn't be impersonating other users. It means that, um, uh, you should yeah, use, use that system whenever you're interacting with the API. Um, similarly, every installed DHS2 application is granted its own authority. Um, so when you install a new app into your DHS2 instance, you will see in the user's app a new authority that you can assign to users that gives them access to that application. I can quickly demonstrate that. Okay, so we're gonna to go to the app management app, which gives us um, a number of applications that have been installed here. I'm gonna look at relationship tracing, first of all. So this is an app that has been installed that we can we can look at. Um, I uh, recommend that everyone yeah, maybe take a look at this application as a, a, an example of some some good things that you can do in a, in a custom app. Um, this is has some some interesting and I don't have the right per permissions on this one, Malaria, so I think in my case. Nope. Needs to, anyway, I need to think about where, how to build this visualization for particular relationships between different, um, different objects. Probably need to do this. Nope, okay. Anyway, I'm not gonna dig into that too much, uh, but this is an application that's installed into DHS2. Um, I can then go to the user's application, um, go to a user role. Let's say I want that, let's say I wanted this um, to be a, uh, available to everyone with the uh, child health program manager role, for instance. So in this list of apps, we'll see that there is a relationship tracing app down here at the bottom. And that uses the, the, the short name of your application. There's also the Query Playground app and some other, some other applications as well. Scorecard um, is another installed application. So if I wanted to grant access to this application for this user, which also would give them uh, access to the, um, the reserved namespace for this application, I would select that and then click Save. Um, I'm not gonna do that here on this server, but Actually, I can, that's fine. Um, so then any user with the child health program manager role now has access to that relationship tracing application. Um, so every, every app has its own authority, which grants access to the app. It also grants access to the, um, the namespace that has been reserved by that application. Um, in addition to that, in your DHS2 app, you can create custom authorities. 
which will show up in that user management application. If we go back to this here, um, there will be additional um, authorities that are created. For instance, this is these are authorities that were created by the bottleneck analysis application for certain things like adding interventions, adding root causes. And these can be assigned, these fine grained permissions can be assigned to specific users uh, or user roles so that they can perform certain actions within the application, but not others. Um, it's important to note, however, that uh, these do not provide any real security out of the box. Um, basically, they just give you a way to assign uh, a, a, um, a, a role to users, but because they're not enforced on the server, they don't provide any, um, any real security benefits out of the box. Um, you can use them to increase security significantly by using a custom backend service to basically check that the user that's making a request has a certain role before performing some operation on the backend. Um, but because it's they are custom, the DHS2 core itself doesn't know what to what to allow and what to what to decline for those authorities. So it's used to um, more often to show and hide different parts of the user interface of your application to different user groups. Um, another uh, kind of security guideline around communication with external servers. Um, when you're communicating with an external server, for instance, DHS2 to DHS2 metadata sync um, or DHS2 to go data sync um, or any other uh, kind of synchronization from DHS2 to something else, um, I would always recommend that you perform that synchronization server side. Um, this means that credentials can be saved and encrypted so that the user can't read them again in the browser, which is much more secure than transferring it over the network all the time. Um, it's much more performant also because the, uh, the, the server is going to be online. It's going to have access to the two other servers. Um, it's more secure because it's behind potentially a firewall. Um, and it don't need to send all of the information through the browser from one server and then out to another server again, um, which can be quite slow and prone to network troubles as well. Um, so I would always recommend that you do synchronization with a server-side component. Um, you can use an application to configure that component if you'd like. Um, I know that that does in significantly increase the burden um, for development, but also for system administrators to set up uh, an additional server component. Uh, but it's much more secure and it, it, it's never secure to transfer and store credentials in plain text. So when you find yourself doing that, be just be, be wary that that might not be a, a good thing to do. Um, in the near future, we're hoping to um, have better tooling for setting up and hosting these uh, server-side components. Um, maybe even in a kind of Next.js style through an application that can define its own backend services. Um, in the meantime, cloud-hosted services are a, uh, an option in some cases uh, as an easier way for um, implementations to spin up and scale uh, integration and server-side componentry. Um, when, that maybe they don't want to manage or maintain on their own servers. Finally, I uh, want to talk quickly about cross-site scripting. Um, if you're not familiar with cross-site scripting, you can you can look it up online. Um, it's a fairly well-known attack for um, websites or web web applications, and the basic concept of it is that. If a user can enter some information and then the website puts that information directly into uh, the, the, uh, the content of the site, um, then there's a chance that that user could enter something malicious like a script tag that, rent, that runs some JavaScript and does something bad. Uh, and you don't want to allow them to do that. So whenever you're displaying anything that a user has entered, even if that user is an admin user that entered it a long time ago in uh, the DHS2 database and you're re requesting it through the API, uh, you should always sanitize that information before rendering it to the DOM. 
that means that if you're, you shouldn't just say dot, uh, like uh, element dot inner HTML equals um, the result of this API request um, because that will uh, basically replace the, the inner HTML, which could include a script tag. So you need to escape the contents of that script tag, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Luckily, React does this for you in most cases. So unless you use dangerously set inner HTML, which I wouldn't recommend that you do, uh, React will automatically sanitize anything that it renders to the DOM um, in, in most cases. So that you should be mostly um, safe if you're using React in a normal way. If you're not using React um, or if you're using React in a very kind of uh, advanced way, uh, just be careful that you're not rendering anything uh, from the API or from user input into the DOM of the, of the page itself. If there is a, a cross-site security vulnerability, um, it could mean that someone could steal all the data from DHS2 um, and that that theft could happen without the user knowing. So this gets back to the first point that I made, which is that uh, if there's one insecure application in a DHS2 implementation, then it means the entire DHS2 implementation is insecure and there are big problems potentially for data and um, user security. That's a quick, very, very high level, quick overview of um, security for DHS2 web apps. Um, uh, we'll now open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions for me about security, um, we can talk about those now. And if not, that's okay too. If everyone is lost, that's okay too. <laughs> I didn't see any question coming in. Okay, no questions coming up yet. Um, uh, okay, uh, do you have a checklist or template? Adam is asking. So there, um, the guidelines for the App Hub submission are a good kind of uh, checklist that you should go through when you're looking at your application to check for some, some common security issues. Um, like I said, we will be adding a, um, a guide for specifically around security. Um, but for now, the, the kind of the best place to look is that um, App Hub submission guidelines, um, which I can show again somewhere here. You can go to guides, App Hub, App Hub submission guidelines and then scroll down to the security section. So there's quite a few kind of best practices here and we'll be adding more to an additional guide. Good question though, thank you. Okay, um, with that, I think um, I need to, upload the example that we're going to work on um, as for, for the exercise. Um, it's not going to be a long one. Um, it's going to be a little bit open-ended, um, but hopefully I'll get some good, we'll get some good uh, feedback and some good um, kind of uh, exploration of an application. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload an app to the, um, the Academy repository. Uh, and I'm, it's, it's an open-ended exercise where you should find and fix as many performance and security vulnerabilities as you can within this application. Um, it's a fairly simple app um, and I'll upload it in just a few minutes um, and then we can uh, go ahead and, and do that. There are quite a few that are very obvious and maybe a few that are more subtle um, performance and security issues in this application um, that you can take a look at. Um, so with that, I think, um, so that I can have a, a minute to upload this, why don't we come back in three minutes, take a quick break, uh, and we'll be back right at uh, half past the hour um, here in Central European time uh, for the exercise um, for this session, and then we'll be done for today. <laughs> 